David on the Run In our last story, we learned about Samuel's death and David's marriage to Abigail. David's community of outcasts and vagabonds continued to grow and thrive under his leadership. Now we learn of Saul's troubled mind resurfacing. The jealousy that once gripped his heart and actions begins to creep back into his interactions with David. So David is forced into hiding once again. What follows is a story of David's victory over temptation to sin and David's failure over loyalty to Israel, as inspired by the book of 1 Samuel. This is Jack Graham with today's episode of the Bible in a Year podcast. In yesterday's episode, we heard how God sent Abigail to intercept David, who had planned to kill her husband Nabal, for this man's disrespect and disregard for the will of God. God was protecting David from spilling blood in a moment of rage, and David, because he was a man after God's own heart, was sensitive to the leading of the Lord, choosing to spare Nabal's life. Abigail, now a widow, was comforted by David, and the two were married, and this was a union that God blessed. Today we'll find David on the run once again. Though Saul had temporarily relented from pursuing David, He is back at it with jealousy and rage once again. Our reading today will show us two sides of a very human David, one who resists temptation and trusts God's timing, and another who gives in to doubts and ventures into dangerous territory. So let's listen to God's Word today. Hatred is a poison. Saul, who had a moment of vulnerability and forgiveness towards David, was once again falling victim to hatred's grip on his heart. Saul's repentance towards David was deep, raw, and emotional. However, it did not last long. Saul once again mustered 3,000 men to march against David. They camped outside the wilderness where David and his men were. In the morning, they planned to rise up and ambush David. Saul was in his tent, eagerly awaiting the chance to put an end to David forever. As the night grew later, Saul and the rest of his soldiers fell asleep. Shadows could be seen gliding across the tent walls near Saul's tent. Light footsteps could be heard entering his tent. There, with his face hidden by the darkness, stood David. He and his men watched Saul sleep. The tip of David's spear was pressed into the ground beside Saul's temple. God has given you your enemy, Abishai whispered to David. David hovered silently over Saul. Saul had gone back on his word. He had repented with tears and embraced him as a son. Who would hold the murder of Saul against him? The citizens of Israel would welcome him. The soldiers would follow him. His wife would still love him. There would be seemingly nothing to lose and everything to gain from killing Saul. David stood there, shaking, with his spear beside Saul's head. No. David whispered. He is God's to strike, not mine. I should not lay a hand on God's anointed. So David put his spear in the jug of water beside Saul's bed, and David and his men left without waking anybody in camp. David sat far off at the top of the hill, overlooking Saul's camp. The sun began to rise and paint the camp a bright orange. David watched as the men arose from their tents and began to prepare for battle. Abner, Saul's general, began to walk among his men. David stood and took a deep breath. He cupped his hands around his mouth and shouted down to Abner, saying, Abner! Abner raised his head to see David standing on the hill above them. All the men stood at attention and watched David as he shouted, Are you truly a worthy man, Abner? You could not even watch over your king one night. Look at the spear beside his bed. I could have killed him last night. You are not fit to protect the king. Saul woke up to the sound of David's voice shouting from the hilltops. He emerged from his tent and looked up. Saul squinted to get a good look at David shouting. Is that you, my son David? David smiled. Yes, it is, my lord king, David shouted. Why do you pursue me still? What have I done to you? If it is God who has called you to kill me, then strike me down now. But if it is your own voice or the voice of other men calling for you to kill me, then cast them away. 
You hunt a single flea like one hunts game in the wilderness. David's words bellowed for all the men to hear. Saul, in the most sincere voice he could muster, shouted back at David, saying, You are blessed, my son. You will surely do many things and succeed. So Saul departed from his place and did not pursue David further. David, still wary of Saul, left back to his men in the wilderness. David did not trust the words of Saul, and paranoia began to grip his heart as well. David gathered his men together to find another place to rest. David knew that Saul would not pursue David if he left to the land of the Philistines. So David and his six hundred men gathered their things and settled in Gath with King Achish. David hid among enemies, a foolish choice disguised as wisdom. David found favor with Achish, and the two of them became friends. Achish gifted David some land in Ziklag and there he and his men dwelled for a year and four months. David and his band of soldiers integrated well with the Philistine people. Together they made raids on the Gizites and the Amalekites. David became renowned among the Philistines. However, David would only raid against Israel's enemies. When Achish would ask who David raided, he would always answer Judah or Negeb to fool Achish into thinking they no longer had ties to Israel. Therefore, Achish trusted David and believed him to be a true Philistine at heart. Today's story begins with Saul once again pursuing David. His attitude to treat David like a son has now been forgotten, and he goes back to his old ways, probably because he really never changed or repented at all. When Saul repented or said he repented, he offered a tearful confession to David but he really truly did not turn back to God. So whatever change seemed to happen was only temporary. And here we find Saul listening to his own fears and paranoia and to those around him rather than listening to God and obeying God. So Saul gathers 3,000 men to go into the desert to find David. But as night fell and Saul and his camp lay fast asleep, David went into the camp and approached a vulnerable king. He was right there to be dealt with, and David's nephew, Abishai, was convinced that this was a clear sign that God had given Saul over to David. It was now time, he said, to kill him and end this threat once and for all. From a human perspective, it seems that David would have been more than justified. Saul had gone back on his word many times, and there was clear intention to harm David. But David wasn't looking at this from a human perspective. He had determined in his own heart that he would not kill Saul. So when Abishai asked David to allow him to strike Saul with his spear and kill him with a single blow, David refused. In 1 Samuel 26, verse 9, we read his response. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David had strong convictions about this. He would trust God to deal with Saul in his own time. Incredible faith, isn't it? He could have taken the easy way out. He could have taken Saul's life. He could have done what he wanted to do, but rather he depended upon God to rescue him rather than take personal revenge. David took Saul's jar of water and his spear and left. The next morning, he made his presence known to Abner, the man who should have been protecting the king. He calls him out for failing to protect Israel's king and shows him that the spear and water are missing, proving that he had been that close to Saul and could have taken him out. Saul heard David and recognized his voice. He called out to him, treating him as a son, clearly a strange choice for a man who wanted to shed David's blood. And yet David maintains his calm and composure and asks why Saul is still out to kill him. Saul seems convicted again. He admits his sin and tells David he'll not seek to kill him anymore. David tells Saul that his decision to spare his life was based on how much he valued Saul's life and how much he valued God's purposes. Saul blesses David and sends him on his way, but the incident shook David, and then we see his faith begin to waver. David goes again into Philistine territory where he's sure Saul won't go. David creates an alliance with the king of Gath and is given some land to settle. 
But David engages in deception, attacking enemy camps and leaving no survivors, but always telling the king of Gath that he is killing Israelites, his own people. David should have trusted God, but he chose his own way. And it's a reminder that even those who are closest to God, chosen by him, and are not immune to fear, failure, and faithlessness. Rather than criticize David for this, we must remember that we too so often fall short. We have doubts and act alone without the presence of God. And it reminds us that we need always to trust God's will in every circumstance of our lives and allow faith to drive out fear. The next time we'll discover that there is a price to pay for David's deception and that lies always catch up to us. Lord, today we pray that we will trust in you and overcome our doubts and our fears by faith. Lord, help us never to get ahead of you or to disobey you, but to always trust you with our very lives. Help us to trust you and your perfect timing for every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to today's Bible in a Year podcast. I'm Jack Graham from Dallas, Texas. Download the Pray.com app and make prayer and Bible study a priority in your life. If you enjoyed this podcast, share it with someone you love or know. And by sharing this podcast, we can get the Word of God to the world. And if you want more resources on how to tap into God's power for Christian living, be sure to visit jackgraham.org. God bless you.